Is this? That's right. Are we back? Yes, we are. Talk like no one's listening podcast. Episode 24. Yeah, what the fuck's going on? I don't know. Shh. Shh. Wow. Let's just jump right in to the weirdness. Wow. Here we go again. This is the episode. Wait, this is the third episode in a row of what I've been calling the podcast obstacle course. Ooh, this one's dense. I got a lot of shit going on. Anyways, if you if you haven't checked out the previous two episodes, I, I have this idea that I started where I just take a whole bunch of sounds and just throw them all together and a bunch of effects randomly on my voice. And I just scatter them all across the course of one hour of recording. And then I start my podcast and I record and I just talk and then... I encounter and experience this weird abyss of sounds, and I don't know what's about to happen. That's why I do it randomly before I start to record. And then I start to talk with no script. And then I just try to see if I can navigate all these sounds, if I can focus, stay on, stay on what? Stay on task. Remember what I'm trying to say for an hour. And not get thrown off too much by what's going on. But also have fun because I don't know how, how many other people have tried this. But it's as weird as it is fun, I will say. In the time that I, I've been doing this for the last three episodes, this is the most fun I've ever had doing this podcast. The previous episodes I did, especially like way when I was starting this out, it was a bit more like, I was doing it just to do it. I didn't really have fun. I didn't like hate it, but I was just trying to push myself to just get through it like a chore in a way. I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And I did that for 20, what, 21 episodes. And I, I gradually got better at it and more comfortable with it and I was enjoying it more and more but once I hit this little thing I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it but this op- this podcast obstacle course thing it just makes the whole process a lot more loose and fun and playful because even if I don't have something to say I can just listen to what's going on in my ears and the headphones and it trips me out, and that's I just have fun doing that too. Mm. There we go. I don't, yeah, I just I'm sober right now, doing this, but I definitely came up with the idea when I was not. And whether you are sober or not, listening to this kind of doesn't matter. Either way, it's gonna sound weird in a good way. So, I do have some talking points a little bit. Just sometimes you need that. Actually, you always need that. No, you don't always need that. But I prefer to at least start with something. So, it's not... Wow. Okay. This, this is the most challenging one I've done so far. I, I, really, I really had to, like keep evolving this idea of what I was going to do for the sounds and the effects and everything and I just keep adding more each time and eventually you know the ideas just go down the drain what can I say but 
there is gonna get there's gonna come a point where I've just done too much and I gotta pull it back but then by that time I've gone too far I don't know it's a little bit unsustainable of an idea I gotta figure out what can I do to do this more because Man, recording in an airport bathroom is tough, let me tell you. Especially when the airport is in space. But, I'm gonna, but I'll do it anyway, you know what? Just guerrilla style. But what I was saying was that I would like to keep doing this because, like I said, it's fun, but it's becoming way more effort and work to put this together to prepare it before I even record and to make sure I'm making it interesting, something new, something fresh, something you haven't heard before, something I haven't heard before, but at the same time to not repeat myself because it's a lot to try to prepare a full hour of random sounds and shit, you know, every time. and. An hour when you're just thinking of sound effects and audio files and all that stuff. It's that's you got to come up. You got to find a lot. You got to pull a lot of material to fill an hour. And there's only so many sounds I have. I'm, I have a lot, but after a while, I'm gonna run out and I'll just be repeating stuff. And I'll find a balance. Maybe I don't need to have all this stuff just constantly going the entire time. I think I'm kind of realizing I'm I'm. I'm I'm a little bit off balance. Need to pull it back a little bit. Or not, I don't know, we'll see. This is just an ongoing experiment. It has been from the very beginning. Which is what is dope about podcasting, and which I always recommend to other people, is that there's no rules. There's no reason to think that there's any right or wrong way to do this because it's just for yourself. That's the whole point. Come up with your own idea. Be yourself. Talk about the things that only you want to talk about. Have the ideas that only you're going to have and express them. Find out more about yourself. Dig deep within yourself and find out you have ideas and things and thoughts about certain things that you didn't realize you had until you say them out loud and then you listen back to it and then you realize, wow, that was in there this whole time. Exploration. That's what it's all about, self-exploration. It's very personal, I'll say that. When I think back onto it, the, all these recordings of this, these episodes I've done so far, when I think about it, it's actually very personal to me because it's, it's me when I'm just talking by myself. So that's about as personal as it gets. It's more personal than I am actually when I'm by myself, if that makes sense. Because when I'm by myself not doing this, I'm by myself, but the things are just happening in my head. So you don't always pay attention to the thoughts you have that are just in your head. But once you say it out loud, then the thoughts get out of your head and you hear yourself saying it and then you hear yourself saying it later again and then it just becomes that much more real. So it's a good way to explore and discover a little bit more about yourself, which I think is very important and helpful to anybody because life is just confusing as fuck, much like these sounds you're hearing. And the best way, I don't know, not the best way, a way that I like to go about it to help with the confusion is to understand yourself as much as possible. Whatever is happening externally out there in the world is craziness. And there's no way to really fully understand the external world. You know, it's happening, there's just an infinite number of moving parts and things happening between what's happening in the natural world and what's happening with humans being as crazy as they are. Trying to figure out and get a grasp of all that and understand and make sense of it, you'll never, you never will. But you have yourself, 
So at least you can go inward and find more understanding about yourself and who you are. Who you are, what you are, why you are. I don't know about that one, but at least when you are a bit more comfortable and secure with yourself, it makes navigating through the crazy external world a bit easier. That's what it is to be human, is to find out about yourself, to understand that you are human. So by understanding yourself, you understand more about what human is because that is something that people don't actually learn about, which is so weird. You don't go through life, like your early life, being taught what it is to be human, the essence of being human, the essence of how to be human, why to be human, just like, what are we doing? What is this? You know, we, we're a physical body with a mind, but we have heart and emotions. We have creativity. We have technical abilities that we can learn and develop, all these different things. And everybody is just different with the specifics of all those aspects of how they are how they're born and how they develop. Everybody's different. So you can't learn about who you are from what somebody else is. Only you can know who you are to truly know who you really are. No one's gonna tell you. No one can understand it except better than you can when you really dive deep and you go in. I added, if you listen closely, there's this really subtle droning kind of chord pad musical thing that's kind of establishing a musical key. There's like this very slow evolving chord progression that's in the back that I haven't done before. That's new. That's, that has a different vibe to it. Literally, figuratively. But I'm just now realizing as I'm recording and listening to it, it's very meditative, having a musical, a constantly moving musical element. So that's cool. I just discovered a new aspect of this that I enjoy. This shit on my voice is really loud. Delay feedback, decay time, on the reverb. Okay, I don't think I actually talked about anything yet that I was planning to talk about. I honestly don't remember what I just talked about for that last 10 minutes. So I'm in a hotel room, really, actually, I'm in Denver. I'm traveling for work. I'm on the road. Shit, oh, my voice is really loud. I'm living this tour life. And Ooh. Oh. Oh shit. And damn. Excellent defense. So I've been Getting a lot of new experience, learning a lot about myself, learning a lot about the world of live music and touring, which is a very important part of me understanding what I do as a music professional as well, because 80-90% of my experience has been based in the studio. And I feel like I've learned just about everything I'm gonna learn out of that side of things. I mean, of course, there's always more, but I've got just about everything I need to know to know how to navigate and work and operate properly, efficiently in a studio. I know how to walk in and just get 
things set up and get set up properly to do good work. And I've just done that way too many times. So it's not really much of a challenge for me. It's not, doesn't necessarily excite me anymore. Just, I feel like I hit the ceiling a long time ago. So to be in this world of live shows and tours is a whole different experience. There's, of course, things that relate to it, of my, my experience that I can relate to apply to to this, but there's a lot of things that are just brand new. And it's very important, I realize, to, if you're a music professional and you are more of a studio professional and you either you're an engineer, a producer, a writer, and you just spend all your time in the studio. Once you get to see the music that you're creating out and played in front of crowds night after night, and you see how people react, you see how the crowds, either they go crazy or they don't. People yell, scream, they mosh, they cry, they cheer, they clap, like all these things you, you see all these different emotions that get pulled out of people from the music. And that becomes the end of the loop, of the cycle, of the life cycle of music. From being in the studio to where the songs are created, they're born, they're brought into this world. They grow up, they go on and have a life of their own once they're released onto the world and people listen to this, these songs. If it's something that they really like, it becomes a part of them, it becomes a part of their experience. They have memories attached to these songs, they have emotional emotions attached to these songs and whatnot, so they become very personal and special to them. And, it, and then if they're big fans of the artist, they become very attached to those artists as well. So once you get to that point in the future when there's a concert and the fans come to see this, these people that they enjoy and they are at different levels of intensity as far as how big of a fan they are from just casual fan that just likes the music, they want to see the show, to the people that wait all day outside in line in the cold to get inside so they can be so they can be front fr so they can be in the very front row and they don't eat or drink or go pee for like 12 hours because they're just waiting it out they don't want to lose their spot and they watch the entire entire show all the way to the very end those are the crazy ones that shit's crazy but they enjoy it and to see the look on their face when it all is happening and you see them just losing their shit. They're crying, they're singing along. They're just happy, they're smiling. They're just so ridiculously excited. They pass out sometimes and need to be removed, unfortunately. But it brings all that, for me, it brings everything in the perspective and gives me this context of what we've been doing in these studios all these years making music in this vacuum where the only we're making it and we're the only people hearing it and experiencing it so it's just isolated just to the small handful of people and it stay it stays with me in my memory as that up until the point where I see it live and I see all these you know thousands of people come out to watch a show and they're strangers I don't know any of them but they've all bought the merch it's visible clearly visible to see that there's a lot of really big fans I mean I guess you're not gonna pay money to come to a show if you're not a big fan but to see how all these people react and you walk through the crowd I like to walk through the crowd and just over uh, eavesdrop on people's conversations and just see what they're talking about, what they're thinking about as it's all happening. It's all very important feedback for me. 
so that when I do go back into the studio, now the studio becomes exciting for me again because now I go into that knowing what it's like when it when it's out there, when it gets to the receiving end of the music in the world of the music consumers and not just being a part of the music producers. It's like going to the gym. It's like training. Hitting that bag. Sharpening your skills. Tripping on drugs. Um, both processes help the other. They complement each other. So for me, there are two halves of this whole. So now that I've gotten more experience on this other half, it all just comes together for me and just makes a lot more sense. And seeing a show night after night, I get a bit more familiar with what goes into producing a live show. Because it is a show. It's I get a bit more you produce a show, a live show, just like you produce anything else. You have to there's certain aspects of what you are capable of doing physically to create something visual on show to go along with the music that the artist is performing. And there's just endless ways you can go about it, but at least now in my head I have I have the vocabulary in my head of how to express and come up with ideas of how this, what could be happening on stage to complement the music performance that's happening. So there's lighting, there's fog machines, there's this like CO2 things that just blast off. There's lasers, there's video screens, there's a lot of other shit. There's just random shit you can have on stage that just lights up and you can just make it light up in however you want. So all these things together, you can combine and you can have it all interact and be like programmed to the music so it all becomes one thing. It's all one moving piece. And it's a whole nother aspect to the world of the song. You create a whole nother life that for these songs. And it all becomes these things that can just enhance the overall experience. People are already gonna enjoy the music. That's why they came, because they like the songs. So you already won on that side. You can of course, you can have a bad performance. But as long as you just deliver the song for pretty much what they are expecting, what they want, then that part's okay. You can, you can do it next level, though, of course. And why not? That's what we should try to do. You can take your songs and you could make new versions of them just for the live show. If it's something that's just music playing back, as a backing track or playback track that has the music, has background vocals and all that stuff. Like That doesn't have to be just exactly how it sounds like on the record. You can change that and edit it in any way you feel like. And you should because it's a different situation for people that are going to listen to songs how they are just when they're at home or in their car or listening to headphones. That's one way to experience these, the songs, but in a live setting in front of an audience, it's a different, it's a different energy and a different vibe. So why not make adjustments if it's needed? Some songs don't need to be adjusted, but some songs can be enhanced by making adjustments, knowing that people will react a certain way. And once you are able to be on a tour like this and you see it night after night, you see what the reactions are, you understand a bit more of how all this music really affects people. And then you can 
use that to your advantage to make these adjustments and enhancements to the songs to just push the excitement even further, push the, the energy, push the anticipation, just all these things that just will get the biggest possible reaction out of the crowd. Making adjustments, knowing that people will... will and you combine that with, like I said, all these visual elements too, so that they are just being, just, they're just overdosing on stimulation, but in a good way. They paid money for a show, so you give them a show. You give them something that is going to impact them, that they're going to go home and they're going to tell all their friends about. They're going to watch all the videos they took all night over and over again. They're going to post them. They're going to spread the word. They're going to tell other people that weren't there and their people are, are going to feel like they missed out, that they need to be at the next show the next time it comes around. And then the fan base just grows from there because it's one thing to just hear people's music and be a fan of listening to the music. So much of that can be so much of that, especially modern day music, is just fake it till you make it. So, so much music out there, it's, you can hear stuff, you could be a fan of music, but as far as the artist, if they're any good, if they're actually talented or not, that all gets revealed in a live show. You really see this person, are they a star or not? Are they a person that can get up in front of a crowd confidently and deliver their music? and really be that person that in your mind you see them as this artist and there's this one they're like this superhero type of person when it comes to music can they show up and really embody that or do they show up on stage and they're really not comfortable they're not ex that experienced they're not that talented so they're insecure so they get on stage and they are just up there doing the bare minimum they just they showed up that's it but when you go to a show and you see that these people are actually going above and beyond your expectations, then you're like, holy shit, these people are for real. These people are for real. There, there's no two ways about it. Someone may or may not like them, but for me, I know this person is for real. I'm a fan, I came a fan, I leave a lifelong fan because I know this person, these people that I saw tonight are legit. They are really about this life. So there's more aspects to that that I've been learning gradually as I've been able to hang out and talk with different members of the crew that handle different aspects of the show. Like I said, there's video, playback, there's lighting, there's fog, CO2, lasers, there's playback, audio playback. There's all these things. There's front of house mixer, there's monitor mixer. So many different things. There's band members, there's roadies, there's music, directors, all this. So, so many different things. I don't feel like I'm necessarily trying to fill one of these positions, but getting a general understanding of how so many different things. they all work together and the how they contribute their different I don't feel like I'm necessarily trying to fill one of these positions. Uh, ha. Brain fart how they contribute, what they contribute to the show, their their side of things, how it all works together, and how it all becomes one thing in the end. And how it all connects to the music also. So for me, being the person that has helped create and record and, and edit and mix all these songs that are being performed, it gives me better understanding and context of the songs themselves. But also because of what me being just as familiar with the songs as I am, 
being one, one of the most familiar people of all, I understand the details that are in the song that a lot of people might not notice, so I understand how to apply these details to the live show. To almost to bring out these details of the song when you might not have noticed it, but when you see a visual component that is going to the beat or is lining up in, in sync with certain aspects in these details of the songs, then the visual part brings it out and then you notice the audio part of it even more. So I remember back when I was working on some of these songs, like say for the Sire album, I did a lot of stuff just on my own. And I, I placed all these little small details in there that you may or may not hear. You probably have to hear them in headphones to really hear all the small little details. And I put them in there knowing that most people won't hear them. But it's something that I did because I know there are people out there that look for those kind of things and I want to like leave these little Easter eggs for them. That's how I I like to hear that kind of stuff when I'm listening to music. I like to discover those little small details that are hidden in the background. So I like to do the same thing. And what I realize is that I've talked to a few people that have told me specifically they really enjoy the fact that there's so many small details going on in the music. And I feel like very, very happy about that. But, you know, finally people hear it and they recognize it and they appreciate it. And that's just why I did it, so that somebody could hear it and enjoy it and appreciate it. But it's fun. It's fun having, you know, a part in helping to put on the show. I, I've never done anything related to the visual part of live production, so getting a chance to be a little bit involved with programming lights, you know, having these lights do things to the beat. You know, some of this stuff needs to be programmed in, just like you would program in like MIDI when you're making a beat. You know, you just hit record and you hit a button to the beat to make it do what you want. So I got to do some lighting cues like that for certain parts of the show. That's fun. And when it comes to the music, because it's all, it's a hip hop show with no band. So it's all the music you're hearing is all coming from playback. So it's all in these TV track edits of the songs that we're making and editing. That's what everyone's hearing night after night. And because there's no, there's nothing for the front of house mixer to mix because it's not, everything's just in a two track. It's not separate parts for them to balance the music. It ends up being that I'm the person mixing the music for the show because it's all about what am I delivering? What file, audio file am I giving to them to play back? That's what they're playing back. There'll be slight adjustments that they'll make just for the specific to the venue as far as the subwoofers, the level, the, you know, the loudness of the subwoofers to just balance out exactly how much low end bass there should be, things like that. But this, it's very, it becomes very different when you hear these songs loud on a concert venue PA system. Everything is just enlarged. You know, it's like taking a picture on your iPhone, but then you put it up on a movie screen. Then you look at it and you're like, oh, shit. Okay, that's, I see a lot of stuff in there that maybe I didn't pay attention to before. So what I do now is what I've been doing recently, just in the past month, is that I realized I have to remaster all these songs for the show. Not, not like drastic changes, but I need to make adjustments to them. Because it just sounds different when it's up there. There's obviously giant subwoofers in every venue, so you don't have to worry about the low end being reproduced, but you do have to now worry about, is it too much? Because now you have the physical capability of just having so much low end playing in a venue that there is, you realize there is a point when it is too much. So I have to take that into consideration 
and listen to, do I need to pull it back just a little bit? And then overall for the other parts of the frequency spectrum, more for like the high mids and the highs because it's so loud. When that, when you've got a lot of stuff going on in the highs and the high mids, this is killing people's ears. You know, it's like, most of the time it sounds good and I'm not wearing earplugs or anything. I'm just listening to the show for what it is. And yeah, it's a bit too loud and I shouldn't be listening to that loud, but I don't feel discomfort. But when I do listen to it, I do feel discomfort. That's how I know I need to just revisit that song and remaster it just a little bit. Re-EQ to pull back on some of those harsh frequencies. Because I've been in the experience, I've had the experience of going to a concert and having the music just be way too loud and harsh and I don't have earplugs and my ears are just toast. So I, it's, I have some, I might have physical discomfort and plus I just can't hear very well anymore. So it's all just sounds like mush. So that, that really, that kind of ruins my overall experience of the show because my ears are fucked up. It's kind of like when you, on, you have, you're about to sit, you sit down for a meal. It looks really good. You're really excited. You pay a lot of money. You're at like a nice restaurant or something. But then the very first bite you take, the food is so hot that you just burn the shit out of your mouth. And then you're like, fuck, I just now, now the rest of this meal, I have pain in my mouth and I can't really taste. So fuck, I just ruined it. Anyway, something like that. I don't want people to have that experience. I want them to hear this music as well as they can, as loud as they can, to be able to hear all the detail in it, to feel the body in the low end and just really have that, really feel that through their whole body, hear the low end just pumping in their chest, have the high end nice and clear so they hear all the details and what's going on, but I'm not killing their ears so that they can, most people are not going to wear earplugs, so that they can go through this whole show, come out at the end of the night, and not have just that pain and that ringing in their ears. As, as much as possible, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to avoid that for people. Because how they feel when they're coming out, when they're leaving, when it's all done, that's, that's the memory that they're coming away with. It. So. Of course, they're going to be on a, coming down, coming off of a high at the end of the show. It's a good show, but if they also are coming away with this harsh ringing in their ears and they're, it's really like apparent to them and they're thinking about it, they're talking about it, I don't want that to taint their memory of how good the show was. So I realize that now a concert venue has become a new re ref listening reference for me when it comes to mixing and mastering. Before, when I would do mixes and mastering, I'm referencing from my speakers in my studio at home, listening to in my car and listening to in headphones. And those are great references, but they are all small references. They, they, don't, don't, they don't go crazy loud. I'm not listening to it in, in that way. I'm listening to it the way most average people are going to hear the music at a volume level that they're going to hear it at. So to hear the songs repeatedly night after night on a, on a large PA system, then you have a better understanding of how th these songs translate and how when you just listen to a regular mix, you can start to imagine where you might have issues once this becomes really loud. I can start to pay attention to like certain frequencies and hear it just as a rate off the record and hear it off of headphones or something. And then I know, oh shit, this is probably going to sound a little harsh in the PA or that bass is going to just sound a little bit too muddy. 
it's gonna sound a little too farty or whatever, like it needs to be a little bit cleaner, a little bit tighter and more smooth. So now I have that in my head so that even when I do get to the point of doing new songs of mixing and mastering, I won't necessarily try to mix those songs to be like directly for a live show, but I can have that in the back of my head and I can make subtle adjustments to know that, okay, I just want to make the song sound right for the record, but also I can just avoid certain subtle things that maybe the client might not under hear or notice, but I, I will and I just say, okay, let me just make this small little adjustment also, just in case this becomes a song that they need to perform and they need a TV track and let's just, it'll be ready to go. It'll sound as good as it needs to be. So like I said, I've been spending the last, well, this whole year of going, traveling on tours. It's all given me this feedback to understand better how to operate when I'm back into my usual world of the studio. Oh, sorry. I'm sitting in a chair that's very, no, I'm sitting in a chair in an uncomfortable position because I have this weird mic stand thing going on. I'm in a hotel room, so I gotta fit in this weird way. So I'm sitting a little, a little bit off balance. That doesn't matter to you though. Another thing I, I learned from tour, it's nothing to do with music. It's just more of like a general life thing. Is it, it really reveals to you who you are. Because the way that tour works and the way you have to travel and the way you have to be on the move constantly and every night is a live show. So there's a lot on the line to make sure that everything is happening correctly and properly and there's no mistakes and there's no technical issues and everybody is you know healthy and in a good mood to go out there and perform and do a good job and it's just creating help everybody helping to create this positive environment to where everybody feels good to keep doing it every night because it's a lot of work i i kind of have i have a an easy version of this compared to the guys that are more of like the dedicated concert crew but it's a lot of work a lot of traveling very little sleep you're constantly moving city to city there's equipment to move in and out set up every time there's your personal belongings you know your suitcase and all that stuff that you bring along that you have to you check in the hotels check out throw your stuff on the bus take it out hop on a plane, whatever, all these different things. You're just constantly moving and everything is always in motion and shifting. So you have to make sure that you are keeping track of all this stuff, keeping track of yourself, what you have to do day to day, schedules, where's your stuff at so you don't leave anything behind. Because once you leave, once you leave town, you left town. So if you left something behind, you're not getting it back. You're not going back to that town for a while. And it's a challenge, I will say. It, it will really show you who you are and what you're made of, what you're good at, what you're not good at. Are you good at time management? Are you good at management of your schedule? Management of, yeah, your personal belongings? Can you keep all your shit together without losing anything? Do you know where your stuff is at? Do you know what you need to do the next day? Where you need to be? What time you need to wake up? And if you're not good at certain aspects, oh, and you're up close and personal with the crew, the whole team of people every day. So you realize a bit about your personal skills. It will really show you who you are and what you're made of. With all these different personalities. And you, you learn of, you learn right away. It's like, how well do you get along with other people? What type of people do you get along with? Who do you not? And sometimes you might not be getting along with somebody or you might just not like their personality, but guess what? You're on the tour with them. 
and you're going to see them every day. So you got to figure out how you're going to deal with that. So there's just a lot of aspects of shit that you got to deal with. And you got to manage it and handle it properly to have a successful tour. Otherwise, you're not going to be on the tour. You're not going to be hired back or you might fuck up and you might be off the tour. You know, people will get fired off tours all the time because they just fuck up and people have to make that call that like we can't have this person traveling with everybody for the rest of this tour. So that can happen. And yeah, it's a challenge. That's one thing I really appreciate about tour is all the things all these other extra things that you learn about and you get exposed to about yourself and how you interact with people and how people work together, communication, organization, all these things, teamwork, you know, it's very, these are all important things. And this is one of the most interesting ways to go about it. It's like, yeah, a lot of people, you know, everybody has jobs and they work at places of work and they have co-workers, colleagues, whatnot. But when everything is constantly in motion and every day is different and things constantly change and issues pop up all the time and you're just in the moment, you gotta, everybody has to figure out right then and there in the moment. What's the plan of action? How are we going to go about this? How are we going to delegate all the things that need to happen? I think that's much more challenging than the average workplace where people, you know, you're in one place, you show up to the same building every day, you have the same task, same job every day. You know, things run a bit more automatic because there's less variables, but this is just variables all the time, nonstop. There's very few aspects to this that are the same every day. So it's never boring. And I don't think I want to be on tour like all the time. But, you know, I don't like to just constantly be traveling. There's a certain aspect of it that is very, that's very tiring. But occasionally, I think it's good to get out there and do it. And when you have the opportunity to do it also because like I said it's a very rare, rare opportunity to be able to do this professionally so you gotta just take all the opportunities as they come and you don't always get to take them on the oh uh, shit you don't always get the best version of it you know it's always not always gonna be totally convenient for you but when it calls Sometimes you gotta just do it, whatever that means. You gotta, you gotta make that adjustment in your life to be able to hop on, hop on this trip. And as I walked around all these nights and walk around the venue as the show is going on, and I, I like to observe from as many different angles as I can from backstage, out in the crowd, walking up in the, all the way to the balcony, go all the way to the back, where the, the people that are the furthest away, what does the show look like to them? Walking just around the bar, just seeing people that are just kind of drinking, they're not really watching the show. People that are in the merch line, buying stuff, watching the people that work for the venue, just getting, taking it, it all in as a whole. Something popped into my head the other day at the end of the night when it was all done and everybody's cleaning up and we're, everybody's getting ready to pack up and just get out of the building and move on to the next place. And I just remember watching a guy that was part of the venue staff and he's just cleaning up, taking out trash, carrying a, a gigantic trash bag of bottles and cups and cans and all that shit dragging it behind him and those bags always have holes in them 
So there's always liquid and alcohol and beer and shit. Like there's always like this stream, like a snail, just right behind them as they walk outside to, to throw it into the dumpster. And, you know, it takes me back to the days when I used to do karate. Right? Some Asian. And it took me back to the year 99, 1999, when I moved to San Francisco after finishing high school. And I moved there to work with my family who had turned our family's restaurant business into a nightclub business somehow. And that became my job that I saw this guy doing. It was, I used to work at this club that was my family's business. And I was like 17. And every night, after two o'clock comes, we turn on the lights, everybody gets out and then it's time to clean up. And I'm cleaning up all these bottles and red solo cups. And I'm the one hauling the big trash bag out to the dumpster. And every night, there's always a hole in the bag, so there's leaking fluid coming out that I gotta watch out for so it's not dripping on my pants. And then I gotta mop it up later, of course. But the smell of it is that undeniable smell of a bar, a stinky bar smell that you just recognize right away. It was really, the visual and the smell brought me back to 1999 when I was the guy doing that kind of stuff. And earlier in the nights, when the party's going on, the club's going off, and the DJs are playing, people are drinking, dancing, having a good time, and I'm walking around, taking it all in, just subconsciously, like, studying it. Watching how... Or remembering how we used to go through those nights where we... Smaller scale, of course, but a very similar thing. Every night we get in, we get set up, set up the bar, stock everything. DJs, promoters come in, they set up their equipment. People set up lighting, decoration, whatever it is that they want to do for that night. They set up a merch table if they're trying to sell something. T-shirts, CDs, whatnot. There's security, there's someone at the door. Handling cover charge. There's a guest list. There's no, we didn't have a green room because we were not on that level. But there's people lining up outside. We're you know waiting for this shit to open up so they can come in and and just fucking party. And that was my experience when I was let's say maybe 17 till like 20. Or 19, no, 17 and 19, or 16 and 19. Anyways, I was doing that kind of stuff. And when I had seen this guy on a recent show at the end of the night cleaning up, it just made me go back 20 years and remember that I've actually been on this ride for 20 years. This isn't actually new to me. All these aspects of what's going on, of music and entertainment, have been in my head. I've been experiencing it and thinking about it and living in it for 20 years. And it, that tripped me out. It was crazy. I didn't think about it until that moment when I saw that dude carrying the, the big trash bag and I smelled that stinky ass smell of the bar that I realized I'm not, yeah, I'm not actually new to this at all. I'm just at the highest peak of it so far. I did have some time off in between when I wasn't really doing music, but I eventually gravitated back towards it. In fact, that's actually just what got me into music professionally was that when I was working my other job before in film and I was doing visual effects, and I thought I was going to be doing that for long term. And then I realized I was very bored of it and I didn't really understand how I was going to do that for like 10 plus years or until retirement or whatever. 
I realized that was not it. I couldn't see myself doing it. I feel like that whole side, that whole course, that whole like a career path had run its course. So when I had to think about what could I possibly do that I know I would be interested in, that I would enjoy, that I'd be motivated, motivated to do until I'm old. I had to really think about that. But what I thought about, what brought me back was just how much I enjoyed being in the world of music, even just at the level of being in the club and being like a bar back in my family's club, cleaning up at the end of the night till eventually learning how to DJ and, and all of a sudden being able to DJ at some of these parties too and be in control of the music also. That's what I realized. I want to come back to that. That is something I feel like will always be with me. And turns out I was right. Because here we are, 20 years later. Crazy. So, I don't even know what the point of that was, but uh, it was just a really... It was just a really like deep realization that I had about my own life and that for me in particular, I can only speak for me, but it's really weird how just all these aspects of my life, oops, drop some paper, how all these aspects of my life, one thing would just build on the next thing and build on the next thing and build on the next thing. So whatever, as I was going through my career of music, from the very beginning, I would always have these moments of being challenged, but then also being able to step up to the challenge and overcome it. And I, I would realize that, oh, it's really good that I had this past experience of doing such and such that made me a bit more prepared to be able to handle this present day situation. And every time I would just encounter a new thing where I had to figure something out and then I could, I did figure it out. It would always be that. I'm like, oh, I remember I used to do this back in the day. So now that's why I have a quicker understanding of how to deal with what's going on now. So I don't know what you call that, but it's been, when I look back on life, it really just seems like there's just been this path kind of laid out for me and I'm just walking it and it's crazy that it's all connected and that's just the 20 years the past 20 years I mean before that I was just a kid growing up in the middle of a small town in America wasn't shit going on there's nothing well here's the thing there's nothing going on for me at that time through my childhood through my teens through high school there's really nothing going on for me that would give me any idea of that I was going to be doing a certain something in life. I, would, I didn't grow up. I wasn't like a little kid super involved in music and anything like that. I wasn't some prodigy. I wasn't some like kid that used to, well, no, I did. I don't know. But I would say for the most part, it's pretty uneventful. But I think because I had, well, here's what all, here, where it all comes together also. Because I didn't have much going on. I got to the end of high school feeling like, the fuck am I doing? I don't know shit. I don't have any skills. I don't have any talents. I don't know nothing. I guess I'm supposed to go to college, but for what? I don't know what I want to do. I live in this town where I don't like anybody. I don't feel like I have any real friends. I need to get out of here. And because I had this strong motivation to just dip, and say goodbye to my hometown and not look back and not stick around for anybody. That's what led me to cleaning up beer bottles and cups at two in the morning. Which led me to right now. It's crazy how that shit works. Like, there's no, like, 
the chances of my life being what they are are just so slim. It's it's so crazy to think about that. That if just the smallest details, smallest little things just didn't happen in life, then none of this happens. The most smallest, insignificant thing changes everything. And it's just a trip that life happens like that. Well, anyway, thanks for listening. This has been the Talk Like No One's Listening podcast, episode 24. Check you guys out next time. Thank you. Peace.